just a few uh, guidelines I want to talk about before we get into the, the good stuff today. Um, first of all, if you have any questions that you want to ask, uh, we would have you put them into the Padlet. Our tech facilitator, Jen Kobalecki, will put the link into the chat, so you'll be able to access that Padlet. Feel free to type in any questions you have, and of course, the Padlet will collect and organize those questions so you can see them later. We'll do our very best to answer those questions in the process of today's webinar, uh, but also hopefully uh, if, if there's some time at the end, we'll be able to engage in some Q&A then as well. Uh, next, remember that everything that we talk about today uh, doesn't mean that you need to scramble with your pen and your paper and jot down lots and lots of notes. We will be sending a follow-up email to everyone that is here today with links to all the resources that we discuss. Um, and as hopefully you, you read about in the description of this webinar, um, as long as you gave us your mailing address, we are also so excited to be sending you some free native lands maps to hang up in your classrooms and maybe a few other little free PBS swag items as well. So we'll be getting those in the mail to you probably in the next couple of days. You can expect them sometime next week. Uh, and it'll be some really fun stuff for you to beautify uh, your classrooms in addition to in addition to honoring these indigenous uh, cultures that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, you saw the little reminder, I hope, this is being recorded today. Uh, towards the end of this, the webinar, we're gonna be breaking up into two grade level specific breakout rooms. Uh, we're gonna be recording those breakout rooms too. So that means that if you want to revisit any of this information later, or if you want to share this information with colleagues, with friends, with other teachers, et cetera, um, you'll be able to find this recording on the PBS Wisconsin Education YouTube channel. Last thing, uh, a lot of people are interested in getting certificates of completion. If you are looking to get a certificate of completion uh, for attending today's webinar, just send us an email at PBS Wisconsin Education and we will reply to that email with uh, your certificate. Those are the four big things. If you give me just a moment, I'm going to put them here in the chat as a little reminder to you all and to me uh, that these are our, our guidelines and hopefully they're gonna take care of some questions that you might have um, that we don't need to worry about now. It saves us a little bit of time. So with all of that being said, let's talk about today's agenda. We're gonna do a very quick uh, introduction of uh, our speakers. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, we're going to be talking about teaching culturally and considering Act 31 with our very special guest, David O'Connor. I, I can only imagine many of you are already familiar with David, but if not, you're going to be learning more about him shortly. Uh, there's another reminder of that Padlet. So again, keep those questions coming in on the Padlet. We'll try to address them throughout the webinar. If we don't, maybe we'll have time towards the end for some Q&A. Uh, we're going to be sharing some PBS resources with you to make sure that all of this great knowledge you're learning today, you'll be able to take it and make it grade level appropriate with students and classrooms. We'll be doing two breakout rooms, uh, one for early learners, one for third through 12th grade, and we'll be talking more about those resources in the breakout rooms. Uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to do a survey and wrap up. I'm so glad that I put this here because this is a good reminder that I need to correct something that I said earlier. Uh, we want you to take a survey, and if you want a certificate of completion, a certificate of participation for being here today, you have to take the survey to get it. So I misspoke earlier, I apologize. It's not as simple as just emailing us. We would ask that you take the survey, let us know how you think we did, let us know what else you want to know, and in uh, return for that little bit of extra time we're asking of you, we'll send you that certificate of participation. That's why you have an agenda on a slide, folks, because it holds the facilitators accountable. It makes sure they don't make mistakes like I just did. Uh, cool. All right. So let's keep it moving here. First thing uh, I want to talk about is just a brief history of Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, believe it or not, Indigenous Peoples Day was only nationally recognized for the first time last year by President uh, Biden. Of course, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day has been celebrated by many other states and cities for 
many years, and it is often commemorated as a replacement for Columbus Day. Indigenous Peoples Day is typically commemorated on the second Monday of October, and it recognizes indigenous communities that have lived in the United States for thousands of years. Governor Tony Evers signed Executive Order Number 50 in 2019, which declared Indigenous Peoples Day here in Wisconsin. And it should also be noted that that order was the culmination of years of work uh, on behalf of students at the Indian Community School in Franklin, Wisconsin. So it's a big deal, right? On the one hand, we can think about the proclamation of Indigenous Peoples Day as a major step uh, that will bring more attention and awareness to indigenous cultures, histories, and contemporary issues. But on the other hand, there's still a long way to go towards true acknowledgement, understanding, and reconciliation. We're kind of at a crossroads as educators. There's a lot happening in the classroom right now. We're all aware of it. I'm not going to get into it, but I do want to make sure that we are not talking about Indigenous Peoples Day in a vacuum. We're here today to discuss all the ways that we might transcend this single commemorative day into conscientiously integrating indigenous learning as part of the educational norm. Uh, in this light, educators, those of you that are here with us today, you are truly our nation's best hope. Uh, teachers today can position themselves as guides in the process of unpacking, unlearning, and relearning. That's a, a big idea that David is gonna speak about later today. Um, obviously, it's a huge undertaking, right? Th those three tasks are monumental, each individually, and we need to do all three as educators with our students. It's a lot. But if you're here now, if you signed up for this webinar, or if you're watching the recording of this webinar later, uh, clearly you're interested in this pursuit. And we thank you for the vulnerability and the bravery that you need to show in that work. We all know that our students are worth, worth the effort, and we thank you for being here with us today. With all of that being said, uh, I am delighted to pass it over to my colleague, Jamie Hoekstra Collins. <laughs> thank you, Michael, and welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. I invite you to look at this map of Wisconsin that includes the 12 indigenous communities and their symbols. And take a moment to honor those communities and the words of David O'Connor when he says, indigenous people have historically shaped the land beneath our feet and continue to do so in contemporary ways today. And if you look at that second northernmost symbol there, that is the Bad River Band of Chippewa or Ojibwe in Northern Wisconsin, of which David O'Connor is a proud member. We are so thrilled to be collaborating with David in this webinar for you today. For those of you who don't know David, he is the education and empowerment leader in the DPI as the American Indian consultant. And he has been incredibly busy the last couple of years. In 2021, he won the National Educator of the Year Award from the Indian Education Association. And just this year, he won another national award honoring Leo Rayano and all of his incredible work with the American Indian community. David is also the um, American Indian Nations and Tribal Communities of Wisconsin Liaison as well as the Wisconsin Indian Education Association, the Great Lakes Intertribal Council, and the Special Committee on State Tribal Relations. David is an alumni of UW-Madison as an undergraduate and master's degree student. He is a proud graduate of the Ashland Public Schools and the Bad River Head Start. David, we are so glad that you are here with us today. Please take it away. First and foremost, I just want to be a uh, big shout out to PBS Wisconsin Education for the opportunity to be in this space. Um, not only I consider them colleagues, but friends as well. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to 
um, be here today and have the opportunity to share with you and learn with you throughout our time here today. And so one of the things I would like to do is share my screen and have it as an opportunity for us to uh, some talking points throughout our time here this afternoon. I just want to double check with my colleagues at PBS is my, my, that my screen is showing. Looks great, David. Excellent. Thank you. So as, as you heard from early on from my colleague, Michael, um, here today, the webinar on honoring Indigenous Peoples Day, teaching culturally with PBS Wisconsin Resources. And so one of the things that I always start off with, as you, as you heard early on from my colleague, was the word teaching culturally. And so here on this screen is a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Running Horse Livingston. I have always the honor to sometimes co-present with him or work with him on different presentations or workshops or trainings or whatever the case may be. And I took this quote from him a good number of years ago as we're at one of our trainings um, that we were having together, working on together. And he said that teaching culturally is not just looking at the end result, but looking at the process throughout the work. And so a lot of times when I hear that or see that or, and I have conversations with him and other ed amazing educators, like many of you across our great state, a lot of times what I always ask is, what is what are you thinking about when you hear that? And so a lot of times I hear like, you know, like people say, it's not just look at the test results or whatever the case may be. But to me, teaching culturally is where you as an educator, regardless if you're a teacher, administrator, school counselor, whatever the case may be, folks, it's where you be can become a guide with your students, meaning you learn with them, not always trying to teach to them as example. And so when I think back to my best, my times growing up, either in my early childhood education, my K-12, or in higher ed, the educators that had the most biggest impact on me were those ones who helped guide me through the process. It wasn't just like getting, it wasn't the grade at the end of the, at the, end of the session or end of the, the, the class or course or whatever, but it was all that work that accumulated throughout the opportunity to grow as an individual, looking at the world very differently from, from, from maybe where I started as example. And so for me, once again, teaching culturally is that aspect of being a guy with your students, learning with them, having an opportunity to grow as well as a professional and seeing them grow as students as well. So a lot of times I get asked is, what is culture? How would you define culture? So a lot of times, I, this is a question that gets popped up quite a bit every single time. And I ask this on purpose every time I talk about what culture is. And so one of the things, a couple of years ago, I was asked by a very, um, uh, amazing person, educator, community member, I'm going on this, asked to define the word culture. And when I was asked that question, folks, I really did struggle. I did. Because in my mind, I was trying to be really technical, trying to think about all these different things that define the word culture. And so for me, it was the little things. So I just started throwing out everything I possibly knew to this individual. Cultures this, cultures that. Basically, I gave her the Mary Webster Dictionary or the Wikipedia version of what culture is. And at the end, she stopped me. She goes, do you feel confident answering? I said, no, I don't. I said, she goes, why not? I said, well, whatever I was saying just didn't seem right. It just seemed like I was putting too much out there or sharing too much. And it just didn't feel like it was, it was, um, it was lacking something. And so she stopped me and she goes, I want you to remember something. She said, I learned this as a community member, I learned this as an elder, I learned this as an educator, I learned all these different things that she was sharing with me. She said, I learned that culture is two words, relationship or relationships plus meaning. And I'll say it again, folks. She said that two, culture equals two words, relationship or relationship, singular or plural, plus meaning. And after she said that, I really struggled, folks, because it seems so simplistic. I should understand what culture is, right? I've heard it. I'm, she just defined it for me. She shared it with me. And I just want to emphasize the person who did share that, that definition with me, folks, her name was uh, Dorothy Davids. She, so a lot of people call her Ann Dot. She was a member of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans. 
if you want to learn, want to have an opportunity to learn a little more about her, I would strongly encourage you to check out this amazing website called Women in Wisconsin. Once again, that website is called Women in Wisconsin. Women historical as well as contemporary individuals who have shaped our state historically as well as presently. And so I'd strongly encourage you to check that out. They have a bio biography about uh, Dorothy David's honor as example. And so after I left that day, folks, after her sharing that definition with me, I drove back to Madison from Boulder, Wisconsin, about two and a half hours south. The whole time I was driving down there, I, I was struggling, thinking about what was to share with me. It just didn't feel right. And there was all these different things I was thinking about, about what is she trying to say at that moment when she shared that definition with me? And so I started thinking of all these definitions, all these different things that she shared. And finally, about a week later, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks, what she was trying to convey at that moment. Is that culture is everywhere, folks. It's all around us. We as individuals don't have a culture. We have multiple cultures. So one of the things when I always talk about people about Native people, Indigenous people, Native Americans, First Nations, whatever term we want to hear is used here, I always say there's no such thing as Native culture. There's Native cultures. As you saw early on from my colleague, we have 12 indigenous nations in Wisconsin. We have over 574 federally recognized nations across the United States. We have over 60 plus state recognized nations as well. And to say that they all have the same culture would really do a disservice to those communities or nations. And so even in our state, as example, I always talk about the diversity of our indigenous cultures all the time. And so one thing I wanna emphasize, if you take anything away from our time here today in our webinar, it's not indigenous culture or native culture, it's indigenous cultures or native cultures, pluralized on purpose. And so when I think about all these different things, so even just as example, folks, when we think about US culture, and so a lot of times we think about dynamics of our regions, so Midwest versus Northeastern culture versus Southern culture. There's differences in our cultures, but even within our own country folks. That's what I was trying to articulate when I was talking about the differences even within our own state between our nations, as well as elsewhere. And so when you think about regionally, we as Midwesterners have a shared culture that's very different from Northeast culture like Boston, New York as example, or very different from Southern culture or Southwestern culture or the Pacific Northwest culture. And I always say it by, by itself, California or Alaska and Hawaii, very different cultures if you've ever been to those states as example. And so a lot of times when you think about it from that lens, it's honoring those cultures on that level. But even as we understand is that, even when you get down a little bit further, we start realizing there's many different cultures with even in those states or regions as example as well. Here's just another way of looking at it, the culture regions as example throughout our country. And so a lot of times when I think about culture folks, we use Wisconsin as an example. So one of the things that I always hear a lot of times when I say, what is, is there a difference between Northern Wisconsin culture and Southern Wisconsin culture? And I always hear a definite yes a lot of times when I ask that question. And I always ask folks, I say, you know, for folks that live in the southern part of Wisconsin, like a Madison or Milwaukee or Beloit, Janesville, Platteville, et cetera, when I ask a lot of them, what, what city or town is a northern Wisconsin city? I always ask this to our amazing educators in our state. And a lot of times I hear different cities or towns thrown at me, from Wausau to Green Bay to Eau Claire, Monaco, et cetera, all the way in between. But a vast majority of the time when I ask that in this part of our state, I always hear one city or town referenced most. Now, I always when I ask that question, they always say it's Wisconsin Dells. My, my response is, if you say Wisconsin Dells is a northern Wisconsin city, there's a bigger issue that we have here right now. And so when I hear about Green Bay, even as an example, that's eastern Wisconsin. When I think about Wasa, that's central Wisconsin. As someone, as you heard early on, shared by my colleague, I grew up up on Lake Superior itself. I always say that's real northern Wisconsin. And so when I, ask, when I think about like, what does that mean to you? What is up north to you? Many of you may have seen this on social media or all the different places being shared throughout. And so for me, it's all about 
place, context, environment, and place, which I'll talk about in a moment, which has a huge part in our understanding about what, what different areas of cultures mean in our state. And so a lot of times, and I always ask this as a follow-up, I say, is there a lot of schools shut down in Northern Wisconsin? So basically we'll say, it's just how about say Highway 29 from Green Bay all the way over to Eau Claire, yes, to Wausau all the way over to Eau Claire. And I would say a lot of schools shut down in late November. Why is that? A lot of people say deer hunting season. And I always ask as a follow-up, is that culture? And a lot of them say yes. And folks, it is. If you look at, especially if you go a lot of our different places throughout our state, deer, deer hunting culture is definitely a huge part that make that defines our state or has aspects of our of our state, our cultures of our state. When I throw off another follow-up, I say, is a lot of times the state of Wisconsin literally shuts down folks. The lat and in, in on Sundays at 12 o'clock or at 325, or sometimes on Thursdays or Sunday nights or Friday, Monday nights. Why is that? I always ask, and they always say Packers. And it's true, right? That is culture of our state for a lot of folks. The state of Wisconsin literally shuts down folks. When you ever, if you ever go to a grocery store during a pack game, you're probably like the only one of few people actually shopping in there. Case okay, so my, I have, I found out some of the hard way sometimes when I needed to have something for either a lunch or dinner I was making during that time, and I needed to go there as an example. So once again, going back to my conversation that I talked about earlier, we have multiple cultures that shape us in many different contexts, folks. So a lot of times when I think about culture, as we think about the Manitowoc Minute, so I love, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Charlie Burns. I actually really enjoy Charlie Burns. Uh, his work, um, both as a alumni, as well as just his work in terms of his comedy. And so what he always talks about up north, so defining that, right? And so I'm gonna read it out loud for us here, folks, as an example. So it's a slang term commonly used in the Midwest, used to refer to the northern woods, often used when describing any location north of Rhinelander. So here's an example of how to define it. Well, hey there, I'm headed up north this week to catch some perch for the fish fry. I heard the fishing is good, so I might even catch some musky. You're welcome to come. I packed up a couple blank to share. Synonym, the cabin to you, you are the UP. Antonym, Lake Geneva or Wisconsin Dells. And to me, folks, language is a big part of our cultures as well. So as a, when I grew up in northern Wisconsin, up, as I said, near Ashland, Wisconsin, so when I, I always, I spoke like everyone else up there. But when I moved down to Madison, a lot of my friends who were from the Milwaukee area, Madison, as an example, they always said, you talk a little funny. I'm like, what do you mean I talk funny? I talk, I'm understanding what you're saying. But they said, you know, every time you finish your sentences, you always say the word A after that, as example. I said, yeah, so what's the problem? And I said, what's the problem there, A? And so it's just interesting to see how dynamics of context, environment, and place play a big part in how we look at ourselves and how we are, how we define ourselves. And so a lot of times when we think about geography, folks, geography plays a big part. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Well, I always tell people it's important that we recognize or understand our geography of where we're located. So last time I checked that place that's outlined that says Canada is not Canada. That's actually the UP. And I always tell people, when you think about geography of our states, sometimes even the even cross those lines plays a big part in our cultures. So this is what I was talking about earlier, folks. Context, environment, and place. So a lot of times as I was thinking about cultures, here, here is even words that we use every single day play a big part in our cultures. So as I mentioned, folks, I'm from northern part of Wisconsin. So when I first moved down here, when I heard someone say the word bubbler, I actually thought it was a restaurant or a building on campus. I never heard that term before. And so after about a week on campus here at University of Wisconsin-Madison, one of my buddies, I asked him, I said, where's the, where's the bubbler? And he all laughed. He's like, don't you ever notice when we meet up near the elevator, there's the thing right here. I said, that's a drinking fountain or a water fountain. He said, no, 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 down here, it's a bubbler. I said, no, that's a drinking fountain. That's what I'm drinking out of when I go there. I don't know about this bubbler thing. It just sounds made up. But in terms of context, environment, and place, it's a huge part of 
individual's identity, right? Language, words that we use every single day. Even switching over to things like this, pop versus soda versus Coke. So I always grew up saying pop, but nowadays I probably say soda pop mixing them together as an example. But the first time I ever heard Coke was when I was down in the southern part of the United States. So I had the, the, the honor of one time when my buddies took me to a place called the Waffle House. I don't know about many of you have ever been to Waffle House. I love it. It's one of my favorite restaurants in the whole wide world now, I should say. And the first time I went there, my buddies, we sat down, ordered our food, and we had, the waitress came up to us and they said, what would you like to drink? I said, I'd like to have a Sprite. She's like, no, what do you mean? Like, I was like, well, she's like, well, I'll get us your Sprite Coke. I was like, I don't want a Sprite. And back in my mind, I'm like, why is she talking about Sprite Coke? So maybe I was like, ah, maybe she's probably uh, mixing them together because she's Sprite is a Coke product. So I switched up. I was like, can I actually switch my order, my drink order? And she said, sure. I said, can I get an orange uh, soda or pop? And she goes, no problem. Get your orange Coke. I said, wait a minute. In back of my mind, I'm like, that doesn't sound right because I don't want orange soda and Coke mixed together. That doesn't even, that sounds gross. And finally, after like switching out the sodas like a hundred different times, I was actually going to say water at one point. And I was afraid she may even say water Coke. Finally, this, this, this couple behind me nudged me and he said, down here, son, everything is Coke. You get yourself, I don't care what drink you get, that's it's tea or something else. Every soda that you, that you purchase is going to be Coke after that, no matter what. So once again, context, environment, and place plays a big part in our understanding of what cultures are. And even as using this example, folks, I was using this, I came across this meme a while back when they were talking about um, Wisconsin being Captain America as an example. And they said, do you know where I can find the bubbler? And Minnesota's like the what? And Captain America represented Wisconsin or 25% of Wisconsin saying the bubbler. And literally Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, literally trying to take out Captain America for saying that word as example. And so once again, folks, it's a drinking fountain or wine fountain, not a bubbler. I know a couple of you and all you will probably say it's the bubbler, David. No, it's not. Context, environment, and place also plays a big part in our language right here, folks. Garbage can versus trash can. Semi-truck versus 18 wheeler versus tractor trailer. You guys versus y'all. And I'll be honest with you folks, I've been really working hard to stop saying that. So I think that's very gender specific. And I want to be inclusive of my language as much as possible rather than have words that could be problematic as example. So I always say folks or colleagues or whatever the case may be has an opportunity for me, my own growth in terms of words do matter. Flipping over to tennis shoes versus sneakers, folks. Garage sale versus yard sale versus tag sale versus rummage sale. And even last but not least, fireflies versus lightning books. I just want to share a couple of examples, folks, of how context environment plays, plays a big part in our cultures, our language. I go on a list of many different things that help shape us, our understanding of these different things around us. So when I think about culture, folks, a lot of times when I think about different things, I always, I always uh, ask folks once again, how does that look? What does that mean to you? And so what I always try to do, folks, is trying to shift people away from talking about the foods, festivities, heroes, and holidays. So when you think about and teaching about Indigenous Peoples Day, folks, as an example, is it just one time of the year or is it year-round? As an Indigenous person, I would say that's important 24-7, 365, folks. I'll say that again. Indigenous histories or cultures are important 24-7, 365. And so for me, if you teach only to the foods, festivities, heroes, and holidays, you miss big aspects of an opportunity to infuse content in multiple areas, not just in versus a area, one area as example. So what I'm trying to say, folks, when I share this as example, is when I use different terminologies like American Indian, Native American, First Nations, Aboriginal, Indigenous, whatever term you want to use here today, folks, once again, I consider it on top of the iceberg. Where that's that in that white section with all the other words up there. When you get to know me a little bit more, just like my colleagues at PBS Wisconsin, when they did an introduction to me, you find out I'm a member of the Bad River Band Lake Spiritual Club. Now you're in the water with me. So, right, 
And that the reason why we're able to get in that space is because we formed a relationship, folks. As we continue to uh, form our relationship, getting to know one another, you find out different things about me, folks. Things that make up who I am, my identity, a big part of all the different things that shape me. You find I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a grandson, I'm a nephew, I'm an uncle, I'm your neighbor, I'm a very proud educator. I love Star Wars and Star Trek, folks. I love DC Comics and Marvel Comics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm trying to emphasize, folks, is when I say that, and a lot of times when we have conversations with, with folks, is that we sometimes have more in common with each other than they have things that separate us. But a lot of times, what we keep doing a lot of times is focusing on, on the top piece, and that's it. And I know why people do it, because it's, it's, it's what you see, it's easy, and et cetera, all the way through. But I would say Hoover should do work should be easy to do. So when I think about the work, I would say at the bottom of the iceberg, where the iceberg is biggest, right at the very, very bottom, that's where you find out Manishinaabe, which means the people are human being in a sense. All these things shape me up, shape who I am as an example. And so from my perspective, folks, it's how do we shift that like, growth mindset versus that fixed mindset. That's teaching culturally one-on-one -on -one right there, folks. How do we move from just teaching about things in units or certain times of the year to teach having it integrated or infused throughout the year, which I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. That really sets the tone, folks, and having us have a different understanding of how do we have this opportunity to, for us to really learn about our communities, our neighbors, in a sense. Or even more importantly, ourselves. Here's another way of looking at it, folks. Just using the tree. So we use the iceberg here as an example. Looking at you from the, from the tree perspective, the surface culture versus shallow culture versus deep culture. So there's multiple lenses or ways of looking at it as an example that help, can help shape your understanding of what culture is or how to integrate this into your teaching and learning. So what are some problematic phrases, folks? We just talked about a couple of them early on as example, how words do matter, folks. I'll say it again, folks. Words do matter. And so right here, I took, I'm gonna read that verbatim underneath the, def the definition that is talked about from the radical copy editor. It says, language is a vessel of cultural stories, values, and norms. In the United States, everyday language perpetuates oppression of numerous people. And, this, and it is the words that we're gonna use up above, above here, indigenous people. Indigenous people exist and deserve respect. They are, we are not historical artifacts, caricatures, or mascots, folks. Practice this truth by questioning the origin and impact of our work. Well, how often have you ever heard these terms here before, folks? And I would say almost all of us have heard uh, many of them, or if not all. So even a lot too long ago, I was watching a sporting event and I heard off the reservation. Or let's do a rain dance. Or holding down the fort. Or bury the hatchet, which I, is a common phrase I hear quite often. Or even the low man on the totem pole. So I was watching one of my favorite documentaries of all time called The Last Dance, featuring Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. Uh, Michael Jordan does that ref references. He um, uses his reference to talk about his time as a rookie on the Chicago Bulls. Talk about he had to earn his stripes in a sense or whatever the case, how he phrased that at that time. But he also shared the low man on the totem, being the low man on the totem pole. And to me, words that uh, we say every day do impact how we may connect with each other or interact or whatever case may be. So choosing our words is huge, folks. And instead of saying things like, this is, let's have a poll about this, say, let's have a meeting about this. And instead of saying what the one the phrase I just talked about, lowest man on the totem pole, say lowest rung on the ladder. Instead of saying, do a rain dance, say, hope for rain. We're, choosing our words is a huge part of our, of defining our identity or who we are. Words really do matter, folks. I came across this on CNN one day when I talk about this resource called Native Land Digital. I encourage you to get check it out, folks. It's a great resource to check out. 
You check if you just type it into Google or whatever case may be, or look on the Wisconsin First Nations website, which is also this resource is located on. You can actually type in your zip code and it'll populate different things, what treaties were signed there, what nation, when uh, the different nations that have that continue to have in that area. I got a long list of different things that this resource shares. But the cool thing I when I came across this, folks, they talked about is that it runs a website where users can easily type in their addresses and see what their their, their land belong to. No, 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 belongs to. Belong to and belongs to a very different meaning behind that, folks. So choosing our words plays a big part in how we can impact our teaching and learning with our student, or our work with students. But it doesn't help folks when we're constantly inundated with messages about people sometimes without even thinking about it, right? From Cleveland mascot, which is now retired, to, the, to, um, to toys, to candy, to books, to knickknacks, to food products, all these things historically have shaped, have shaped, sometimes shaped our mindset and how we may look at things as example. And so for me, my goal is always to push folks to get into this space of where we start seeing folks, maybe not only defined maybe by their heritage, but also defined by their professions. Here's a whole bunch of people ranging from medical physicians to uh, activists, to pro professional athletes, to poet laureates, teachers of the year, politicians, journal, uh, journalists, authors, federal judge, NASA astronaut, all these things help play a big part in how we can look at people differently. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, folks, and I'm just gonna share, I'm gonna do a quick exercise for you to see what I'm trying to refer to or share when I'm saying that. So one of the things that I always see, con like one, uh, when I do this exercise, is just kind of seeing how people uh, can relate to what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to go to Google, folks. You can use different search engines, whatever the case may be. So I'm just going to type in American Indian. I'm going to see what type of imagery pops up, folks. And so a lot of the images I'm consistently seeing here, folks, is images that are mostly historical. I type in American Indian, most of the time, most images are men. And if I do see images in here that are contemporary, we're always in like power regalia. So not so much like a t-shirt and jeans like this uh, mother and daughter right here as example. So how about if I switch out the group? I'm saying, say American Indian, I type in black or African American. It's mostly contemporary imagery, mix of men and women. Mostly individuals though. So not so much groups of people, but mostly individuals. All by switch out the group. Hispanic or Latinx American. Contemporary imagery, mix of men and women, but not so much individuals as more groups of people though, being represented in these images. All by if I switch up the group again. Asian American folks. The same thing as Hispanic or Latinx. Contemporary imagery makes of men and women, but mostly groups of people versus individuals. Now I'm gonna type in just real quick folks and see if, if instead of saying Native American or American Indian, I type in Native American, see if it really makes a big difference. It doesn't folks. Mostly historical, mostly men. And if you do see contemporary images, it's mostly in power regalia as example. So imagery plays a big part, folks, in how we form identities of people sometimes. Now remember, folks, this is all an algorithm. So this is what we as individuals every day, single day, will be type in to try to find these images as example. And even most interesting, when I look at the words above here, you have things like art, headdresses, drawing, wolf, eagle, tribal, horse. Those are all descripting words when I type in the word Native American. Going back to my screen or my presentation. Versus seeing images like this, folks. That's what I'm always trying to push educators on as example. I have an opportunity to reflect upon who Native people are, not only historically, but today as well. And so a lot of times when I even ask educators all the time, I say, name me three famous Native Americans or Indigenous people. 
And I would say overwhelmingly, folks, I would say 90 plus, 90 to 95% of the time, the common names I always hear are people that live pre-1900. And they're almost always men too. So think about that, folks, how representation matters. If I'm not seen, how am I being represented? I'll say it again, folks. If I'm not seen, how am I being represented? And so from my perspective, if I, sh if I ask this question, name me, you know, certain other communities or demographics, and you start rattling them off with different names, that's representation mattering. And so does this, folks. Native people have always historically shaped our state. We shaped the state of Wisconsin today. We have shaped the United States historically. We shaped the United States today, folks, in many different ways. And so as you hear me talk about throughout, folks, why culture matters. It matters on many different levels, folks, because it impacts every aspect of our lives. I'm not asking you as educators to be an expert in every culture. That's impossible, folks. What I always tell people when you are starting to teach culturally and you, have a, and you start looking at it from the lens of your students, it becomes very different, folks. I had a teacher not too, one time as example when I was talking about culture matters. Um, she shared with me all these different stories about um, food, and I was like, "Well, why is why is you know why is why talk about food being impactful for Indigenous people?" And she says, "It should. Be, why wouldn't it be, David, when sixty to seventy percent of all foods eaten around the world are native foods historically? And how how often did I not know that kind of stuff? From the potato, tomato, all these different things." help shape the world's cultures without even thinking about it. So the potato most often not gets associated with being Irish or the tomato most often not being associated with being um, Italian or Sicilian. But in historical, it actually has roots in the indigenous peoples of North and South America. That has a huge impact on having an understanding about how native people have shaped the world historically as well as contemporary folks. So how do we incorporate this into our teaching learning folks? So I used to call them the three eyes folks. Today, I've switched my language around, talking about them being seen as through the four eyes. And so for me, I used to say inform is to be acknowledged. So a lot of times when I hear that word, I always hear people say, I acknowledge this or acknowledge that. That's and so like a land acknowledgement example. And my response is, how do we shift, not only talk about that, we're moving beyond that to action steps that can come with that thing, like oh, something like a landing dodge, right? It's happening. And so when I think about the four eyes, there's a lot of different ways, uh, the way I are articulated with educators like yourselves and many others all the time. So the first eye is inform. Like I said earlier, folks, and I'll just read it verbatim and I'll share a little bit more about what I'm trying to say. The first stage is inform. It's so where educators are just acknowledging or being notified what they are required to know or do. That's like, like I said, as example, you're required to teach and learn about First Nations of Wisconsin's history, culture, and tribal sovereignty. That also known as Act 31. So you're being informed that you are required to teach that. Or you're acknowledging you, like I said, you may live on the land of so-and-so. That's where you're being informed as example. The second stage, I uh, was called an including stage. This is where educators may introduce a resource or two into a curriculum, but they don't feel comfortable with the content. More often than not, when I see educators do this, folks, it's usually to supplement their teaching. So a lot of times, I'll, someone will say, David, do you have any good recommendations of movies or documentaries or whatever case may be? I would love to share that with my student. Or can you, can you recommend with me a guest speaker? And my response is first and foremost is, what are you doing right now to introduce the material or the content to your students? And the first response is, I, I'm not. And my, my response is, so you're going to have a guest speaker come in and have him or her, they speak on something, but without having content for your students. And, she, and more often I'm like, yeah. I'm like, well, I feel like that you know, like pushes the responsibility off from you onto someone else, when in reality, if you're teaching culturally, folks, you would understand that it's okay to make mistakes. So we're usually in this in this stage, folks, what I always try to push people into that part is 
the understanding that's okay to that, like what we just heard from Michael early on, be unpacked, unlearn, and then almost have to relearn content. And I always tell people, don't look at things as a checklist, as this image is right here trying to showcase or indicate. Because when it comes across as being just a checklist, that's how our students may see it as well. When you do something minimum, that's what you get back in return. And so when I look at resources, they should help support the instruction, not supplant. I'll say that again, folks, because I always get this quite a bit. It should help support your instruction, not supplant your instruction. So that's the including stage, folks. The integrate stage, folks, the third one. As educators, we continue to build on our knowledge base. We may move into the integrating stage or the integrated stage with content while plugging in more and more diverse resources. The thing with this, folks, is that when you're in this stage in your process, you're still making mistakes here and there, and you're not plugging in resources naturally as where you'd like to, but you're, you're, you're already starting to move away from actually caring about that, meaning that you're not so much focused on that because you're just trying to understand that you're learning and growing as well, just like your students, teaching culturally 101 again. Have an opportunity where you can plug in resources throughout the year, but you feel like your content is still not as where you want it to be. But you're starting, you're building it up. The last stage, folks, also known as the infused stage is where we, you as educators can fluidly and naturally share information resources throughout the whole year in your efforts to learn with your students. That's huge, folks. Because to me, you're not second guessing yourself anymore and you're not worried about mistakes in this stage. And your, your understanding is that you realize that the more you learn, the more you need to know more. That is, to me, that's very humbling. As someone who is all the time uh, called upon to work with amazing educators like yourself, I find out things that I never looked at um, in that way and I learn all the time. I'll give you a case example, folks. A few years ago, I was asked by an amazing educator. I was at a uh, CISA training, one of our cooperative educational service agencies, one of our 12. And this educator said, David, I teach sovereignty every single day in my, in my class. I said, you teach it every day? I said, can you explain that? And I, said, and I was expecting this person to say, show my own bias, folks. Maybe 10th grade U.S. history as example, 8th grade civics, maybe 4th grade at the lowest. And the person said, no, David, I teach 4K and 5K. I said, you teach 4K and 5K? He said, yeah. I said, you teach sovereignty every single day? And they said, yes. I said, can you explain to me how do you share that? And you know how when someone says something to you and you really are not buying into it? I must have showed my poker face at that moment because she got, this individual got a little frustrated with me. And I was like, I'm just curious because I've never seen a concept like that taught so, uh, to someone so young. And she said, David, follow along. Not only did I teach it, like I said, but I teach it every day. I said, okay, please explain to me. And she said, this is how I do it. Every single day, I teach my students how to make and maintain promises. She said, the last time I checked, David, that's treaty making one-on-one. I said, you know what? Here's the mic because I'm done. The rest of this training. That, to me, she, the way she articulated the way she said it to me was spot on, folks. Because that is the way, and she said, it's my job as a 4K or 5K teacher to instill that into my students where I'm infusing this into my classroom. And as they go up grade, for grade levels, they learn about different things that add on to it, scaffolding, whatever term we want to use here today as example. And that is huge because it sets the precedence for opportunity for growth for you as educators as well. So you're not always seen as the content experts, are growing in terms of your own practice as well. And here's a resource which I'm gonna share with, with our, our amazing folks later on, folks, that, you, that I would love to have you check out. It talks about just don't teach about cultures, teach culturally, here's the difference. Another resource which I'm gonna share with my colleagues at PBS to share with you as well, is called Infusing Multiple Narratives in History Classrooms, Native American Studies. 
And last but not least, I have an opportunity to hear from myself and two other individuals when we did an interview with Houghton Mifflin Hair Court called How to Teach Indigenous People's Day. Opportunity for us to when we were just talking about here today as example. When I think about different things, folks, one of the things I want to emphasize, which you're going to hear later on more and more, is an opportunity for to so for, talk about diversity in children's books. So one of the things that we're going to hear loud and clear from your my colleagues at PBS is talk about some of the amazing resources you as educators can use. Going back to our conversation that we just talked about, representation does matter, folks. And so for me, this is actually an image that was done by the CCBC, the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So when we looked at books in 2015, they found about, and about three fourths of the books were about Euro-American or white characters. In reality, folks, there was actually more about animals and trucks than there were about all these other groups put together as example. And, the one, and then when they did an updated version back in 2018, folks, yeah, there was more about animals and other different characters, but the representation of other groups didn't go up as much. And to me, what I always try to tell folks, books about American Indian or Native Americans, it's not just good for those, for those students from those that communities or nations. It's good for all students. Books about Black or African American, not just good for Black or African American students. They're good for all students, folks. Latinx or Hispanic, as well as Asian Pacific Islander, et cetera, all the way through, folks. Representation does matter, folks. It does. It plays a big part in how we can look at the world differently around it. I would strongly encourage folks, if you ever get a chance, to check out this amazing resource on uh, his website called Learning for Justice. It used to be called Teaching Tolerance, uh, called Windows and Mirrors. As you can see, this image is looking at all these individuals are looking at mirrors here. And as you can look, look closer sometimes, folks, there's some cracks in the mirrors, different things. Maybe not, so what I'm trying to, when I'm trying to convey or say as an example is that maybe not seeing themselves fully there. It's a huge, huge it has a huge impact on the, on the needs of our students. All these different images right here, folks. So as I shared, folks, just a minute ago, representation does matter, folks. As you can see from this infographic, it was being designed, all these different things, but what do you see? You see I see a frown, I see cracked mirrors, I see a piece of the mirror on the ground. All these things have a huge, huge impact in identities of ourselves and the students that we serve. So finding resources that are both accurate and authentic is key, folks. I'll say it again, folks. Finding resources that are accurate and authentic is key. Because there's a lot of resources, folks, that I see that are used. I don't know if I'd even use those as resources I wouldn't even uh, share with educators not to use. But they're being used in classrooms. And there's other resources where I would love to see them being utilized a lot more. And I, and I would feel like they're sometimes underutilized. Representation matters, folks. So when they did an exit poll um, after the presidential election back a couple years ago, they're breaking down different demographics. And so myself and other groups of people were put into the some, something else category. I don't know about you folks, but being called other is bad sometimes. It is. But to be called something else, literally, that's, that's a huge, huge, uh, talk about how identities um, can be like taken out or not even be seen as example. Instead, we're going to hear about some amazing resources from PBS, such as Molly Denali, or even representation in, in the um, Nickelodeon show called The Cast Grenades, or there's Charles Little Boy, he's a, he's a graduate student how that has impact on not only if I was a native student or native person seen it, but if I was a non-native person seeing representation. So all these things, folks, play a big impact in our, in our world. So as we start thinking about how do we celebrate or how do we think about Indigenous Peoples Day being celebrated year round, right? Sometimes it's just taking on some different things where you can talk about students, how to look at the world differently. So a lot of times when I see, I came across this image from an uh, uh, educator here in Wisconsin, 
when he outlined North America. So for many indigenous communities, they may call this land Turtle Island, Mikinik Island. So it's Ojibwe way of saying it. So as you can see, there's the head, the arms, legs, the tail, all these different things that make up North America as an example. And I always tell people it's not a coincidence that the center of, of the turtle is the, the Great Lakes, so the heartbeat in a sense. And so, as you heard from Michael early on, talk about the unpacking, unlearning, all these different things. According to my cousin, Yoro O'Connor, you must unlearn what you have learned. And once again, that's unpacking, which you know first and foremost. That's unlearning and having the opportunity to relearn before you actually engage in teaching learning, folks. Because I want to emphasize some folks. You can have some of the best resources, the best lessons, best curriculum in the world, but if you don't unpack and unlearn, you can actually do more harm than good sometimes with those resources. I'll say that again, folks. If you don't unlearn, unpack, or even try to relearn during the process, and you, you can take the most amazing resources in the world, but if you don't try to get to past that stage, you can actually do more harm than good with those resources. That's why I always try to tell educators, sometimes it's, it's a good to reflect on where you've been to where you're possibly going in terms of your instruction of your students. Now, all these different things, we're gonna hear about resources. But one thing I wanna emphasize as we think about this, this resource, which you hear from Michael and Jamie and others talk about, here's a good collection of resources that I would strongly, strongly encourage you to check out as good tools or resources to use with your students. One, you can help you know, have an opportunity for a help, help you um, unlearn, unpack, and relearn different content yourself, but also good for your students as well. But even in my house where I've practiced, I always encourage um, multiculturalism and different things. I always tell people all the work that I ever do every single day, I think I focus on these two. These are, this is my oldest, with the cap and gown on or a cap on is my Ava Marie. And my youngest is that's Eliane O'Connor. So every single day, folks, when I'm engaged in work across Wisconsin or engaged in, web, in a training like this as a webinar, as an example, I always think about making this world a better place for them. So I want them to have every opportunity to be successful, be every opportunity and be who them, and most importantly, just be themselves. But even in my household where I, where I encourage opportunity for my, my, my children to look at the diversity of the world, they do pick up biases like or in stereotypes and myths just like any other, but you know, like anybody else. So all my household are known as dad or daddy, but I'm also recognized by this gentleman's name. So for a lot of folks who may not know who this is or may know who this is, that's Maui from Moana. So every time this, this, that movie's playing, you're always like, my girls are always like, dad, you're on TV. I said, that's not daddy. Stop calling me that. So after about three years of hearing that, I finally came to one day. And I said, you know what, girl, my girls, you're welcome. So I took a line from the story. Here's my contact information, which will be shared with you at the conclusion of our training here today, folks. And with that being said, folks, I'd love to turn it over to my colleagues at PBS Wisconsin Education. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, David. Uh, I have been through uh, your trainings before and they are as informative and as meaningful and as engaging as they've ever been. We are so lucky to, to have you here talking to everyone today. Thank you, that was really, that was awesome. Um, so we saw in the chat of some people, you know, they're, they're hungry for resources. David gets everyone motivated. David inspires everyone. But what about those resources? You know, we, we start to feel really, really inspired to do this work, but it helps to have the right tools. As David said, right, we want to make sure that we have the best tools because the wrong tools might do inadvertent harm. So hopefully what Jamie and I have to share with you today are the right tools. Before we get into our breakout rooms, though, uh, just a few reminders. I know I mentioned this earlier and Jen put it in the chat earlier too, but breakout rooms will also be recorded just as a heads up. We're doing that 
uh, with both of the breakout rooms. We're going to have an older uh, kid breakout room that'll be third through 12th grade. We're going to have a younger kid breakout room that'll be pre-K through second grade. Both rooms are going to be recorded. So if you happen to be someone that really wants to be in two places at one time, choose one for now and know that you'll be able to watch a recording of the other breakout room later on. Uh, also remember we have that Padlet. That uh, link is still in the chat, thanks to Jen. So if you have any questions, drop your questions in the Padlet. We will uh, reconvene after our breakout rooms in approximately 20-ish minutes. Uh, so there might be a little time there uh, to answer any lingering questions that folks might have uh, before we wrap up. Um, and also remember, we're gonna uh, give you the opportunity to take a survey, give us some feedback. And if you do that for us, we'll make sure that you get that certificate of participation. So very quickly, I know that many people are familiar with Zoom breakout rooms at this point, but just in case you forgot, just in case you need a reminder, here you go. Uh, so down in the corner of your screen, there's going to be a little four tile square that says breakout rooms. You're going to click there. And then after you click there, oops, let me stay here. You're gonna see your options. We're only gonna have two rooms. One is gonna be for pre-K to second. Jamie's gonna be leading that room. The other will be third through 12th grade. I'll be leading that room. So pick which one you want. And then if you need to ask for help, you'll notice also at the bottom of your screen, there's a little uh, circle with a question mark in it. Click that to ask for help. Jen will, will graciously help you make sure that you get where you want to go and you're not just floating awkwardly in cyberspace. Uh, these are going to be very quick, uh, like, like run through tutorials. We're only going to have about 20 minutes, but I promise they're going to be worth your time. And again, a reminder that whatever we cover now, we're going to send you as links after this webinar is over. So don't feel rushed to write things down. Don't feel rushed to take lots of screenshots. We will send you a follow-up email with links to all these resources after the webinar today. I also just saw Jen pop on. Jen, do you have something to share? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick modification to what you shared. Hello, everyone. Glad you're here. The ask for help button is when you're in the room if you're having trouble, but you and Jamie will be there too, so they can help you as well. But for right now, if you're having trouble selecting a room, you can either unmute and let us know where you'd like to go, or you can put it in the chat and we can help you sort. But hopefully if you look at the bottom of your screen now, there might be three dots that say more. You can click that and you should see the breakout rooms. They are open. So folks can feel free to start selecting and moving into those spaces. And I'll hang out here to help anybody that needs help getting where they want to go. Great. Thank you, Jen. Everyone else, we'll see you in about 20 minutes. Hello, everyone. Thanks for hopping into the early learning breakout room. Uh, if any, Before I start, if anyone has any questions, I know Lisa put into the chat that she's looking for some very specific things as a music teacher, but I'd love to hear from you or see your wonderful faces. No pressure. I know it's a busy time of day and you've probably taught all day long. Hello, Barbara. Hi. Hi, Emily. Nice to see you. Great to see you, too. All right. I'm multitasking, eating a little bit, so I'm <laughs> no problem. On and I'm no problem. Glad that you're here. Thank you. If, if there's anything you'd like to tell us from the College of Menominee Nation, we'd love to hear from you. All right, well, I'll just start with the resource that, um, let's see, I think I'm still recording. Okay, I'll start with the resource that David was showcasing us. Um, and it's the First Nations site, which I have a feeling many of you are familiar with. All right, and let me just read here from our College of Menominee Nations. Oh, thank you for the limited camera. Got it. Thank you for letting me know. All right. And I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with this beautiful site, the Wisconsin First Nations American Indian Studies in Wisconsin. It's a partnership with um, the DPI and PBS. 
And so one of my favorite things as an early learning teacher is this curated book list per grade level. And so this photograph is just some of the gorgeous um, titles of beautiful children's books available to you that are written and illustrated by Indigenous people or about Indigenous people. One of my favorites is Fry Bread. It's just such a beautiful story of fry bread and how it bonds a family together. And it also includes a recipe at the end that I found very simple to make with children in the classroom. And I invite you to do the same. Um, I'm going to head, go ahead and click on this link so we can just sort of get a look into the website. So here are the curated book lists. There are tribal lands maps and we will be mailing those to you. And there are also um, ideas about field trips where you can go with your students virtually or you can um, write the different sites for more information or maps from their sites if you're doing some kind of a project about different geographical indigenous sites. So there's all sorts of surprises in this gorgeous website and further connections that you can make with the indigenous community. So definitely bookmark this one. Um, and then you can go through the tribes um, getting stories of contemporary um, Indigenous life there and really just explore the different, the different perspectives within the First Nation site. All right, but the major resource that I'd like to share with you today actually comes from Molly of Denali. And that is a PBS Kids collection that I'm hoping many of you are familiar with. Hello, I'm back. Sorry about that. I don't know why Zoom likes to do that to me. Are you familiar with Molly of Denali, Barbara and Lisa? Yes, I watched oh. it. I'm retired. I can take time to watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I, not, I don't see it regularly, but I, I, I like it. Great. And Lisa, this could serve as inspiration for some of your musical lessons that you're thinking about developing. But I just think it's important for you to know that the series was developed with more than 60 people who are Alaska Native, First Nations, or Indigenous. And I love showing my former students, I'm a former kindergarten teacher, the photographs of the people who voice the characters. And I feel like that's always sort of a mind-blowing experience for little ones. Like, mm -hmm. wow, they're a real person? And they're from Alaska, and they're Native, and their name is Sovereign or Sequoia? Wow. And so here they are. Some of the um, biggest characters on the show are depicted. And just know that behind the scenes in Mali of Denali, um, these indigenous people write the scripts. They advise on the cultural and linguistic issues. They record the theme song and clearly they voice the characters. So every episode of Molly Denali, but also the games. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for telling me that. That's helpful. Should we go back and take a look at the characters so you get a nice view of them? Every episode, every game, every app, and including the podcasts of Molly Denali are all infused with Alaska Native values, history, traditions, language, and contemporary life. So I don't know if any of you were at the webinar last week. We had panelists talking about um, some of their families' experiences with Orange Shirt Day and boarding schools, but there is an episode of Molly of Denali called Grandfather's Drum, and this picture is from that episode where Molly learns that her grandfather, Nat, was sent away to a boarding school where they told him he can no longer wear his traditional dress or play his drum. And so her and her best friend, Tui, use their abilities to discern informational text through little messages that they see on photographs of signs of the city or town and work to uncover the mystery of Grandfather's Drum. And I won't spoil the ending for you, but it's a beautiful episode. And I know mm. David O'Connor has told me that he loves watching this one, especially with his daughters, and it always makes him cry. It's just that touching and beautifully done. So I would like to share with you a little clip from Molly of Denali. So you just have a sense of 
all the intentionality that goes into the making of this series, and then some corresponding resources that I think you will find helpful. So let's take a look into Molly of Denali. <laughs> Tui and Trini. Hi! <laughs> Molly of Denali is about a 10 year old Alaska Native girl, Molly Mabray. Yes! Woo! Who lives in a trading post with her family near Denali. Denali Trading Post! And it's really about her daily life playing with her dog Suki and her friends and having adventures. Whoa! Is that where we're going, Nina? Yep! I think it's important for kids to meet Molly because she's adventurous, she's smart, and she's kind. Surprise! <gasps> Molly! I've always wanted to do a kid show that was set in a store. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a store located in Alaska? Your backyard could be the great outdoors. Surprise! Wow, it looks so wild. <gasps> I see caribou! I grew up all over the state of Alaska. I'm a Netsaiguichen person. And growing up, I never saw people that looked like me on television. So when I saw that the production was looking for a creative producer, I was like, this is a dream come true for me. Do kids in Alaska still sing traditional songs? I just saw this major opportunity to get things right. It's important for kids to see themselves reflected on screen because if you can see it, you can be it. Hey everyone! So if you've been wondering, how big is Molly's village? I love what she just said. If you can see it, you can be it. Let's just stop that sharing for just a moment. I have a feeling that we are not recording anymore. Oh, we are. Okay, great. Thank you for your patience. Um, <laughs> I'm not able to get out of my YouTube screen. Yee. There we go. All right. So we've got a little bit of the background of Molly of Denali. Um, every episode is based on Alaska Native values. And here they are for you to look at. And it just deepens the foundation of the show. So when I say episode, I also mean that these values are integrated into the games that Molly of Denali provides and the apps. Uh, for example, there's a game um, about salmon fishing and children have the opportunity to pretend to salmon fish with Molly and her dad. And when she catches too many, she puts them back and references the Alaska native value of um, taking care of others and accepting what life brings and sharing what you have and saying essentially this is too many we don't need all of these and putting them back into the sea and so just another beautiful example of how rich the show is and how deeply they use the Alaska Native values to guide each resource in its development and so where do we find those resources you're wondering the first collection that I'm referring to is in the PBS Learning Media, and this is deep and vast and wide. And I'm just going to click in here and take you on a little resource walk to help you get oriented to all of the options within this collection. So here it is, Molly of Denali, and you can see that it comes with lesson plans, interactives, videos, and um, other documents. And so it gives you a little overview of the show and then it includes bilingual um, lesson plans for different episodes. One of my favorites is the episode featuring Elizabeth Paratrovich, who is an indigenous civil rights leader. And so I'm just going to go ahead and click on this episode. Molly of Denali learns that one of her aunties um, was alive, one of her great aunts was alive when Elizabeth Paratrovich was a civil rights activist and 
is able to go back in time. So I love that in the image of Elizabeth, she's black and on black and white television here, helping children understand that she was from long ago, but made today so much better and enriched because of her activism. So it gives you some information about that episode and also other supporting documents to help you teach a lesson like this. So um, one of the things that I love that's included within Molly of Denali are things like the teaching tips, but then also actual lesson plans. So one of them is actually called Brand New Flag where you have an opportunity for students in your class to make a flag that represents their family or coming together as an entire class and creating a flag for your classroom community. What are the values that you stand for as a classroom? What symbols would you choose to depict um, your sense of equ equity and equality within your school environment? So um, just different examples of all of the things included within the Molly of Denali collection. I'm just going to go back to that initial page then and feature some of the other ones. I love that so many of the resources within Molly of Denali are also environmental in focus. So um, she has to engineer how to make a tree house. They're, they're, it's just so fun to explore. So I hope that you take this um, website back with you and dig into Molly of Denali and all of the things that... Um, she could support in your own classroom instruction. Does anyone have any questions about that at all before we move on to the next year? I feel like walking through resources online is a little bit like dizzying. All right, going back to my screen share again then. So we've got the PBS Learning Media Collection. There's a Molly of Denali podcast. You can search out the games and apps. And then there's a section um, for PBS for parents that helps guide some of the more sensitive topics that can arise, like the boarding school episode of Grandpa's Drum. And because it's PBS, you know that they'll approach it with such great sensitivity and respect. So again, Every resource infused with Molly of Denali is age appropriate. Um, Lisa, you might really enjoy the Ask Molly segments. So every episode has the um, illustrated story of Molly of Denali. And then the Ask Molly segments are actually real people featured that have some kind of a connection to the Molly of Denali episode. In this segment, um, it features actual Alaska Native children who are referencing the Elizabeth per Peritrovich episode and talking about what they think it means to be um, an activist for racial justice and what they do in their own schools and communities to make it so. And so exploring the Ask Molly segments, I think, are just as fabulous as the show themselves. And then again, there are family viewing guides. So if this is something that you'd end up recommending to family members in your learning environments, these guides would support you in featuring some of this learning and supporting the questions and answers and discussions that might arrive from sharing these materials. Um, I am so excited to share this artist with you. There is a new Wisconsin biography coming out. I, I'm hoping in later fall, but I'm not completely sure. And it's on Electa Quinney, who was one of the first educators in the state of Wisconsin. Thank you, Barbara. Do you want to add anything else to Electa Quinney's story? Well, what what I know is that she she not only was one of the first educators, but at UW Milwaukee, there is a whole a scholarship program uh, that brings in scholars uh, from across the country to teach. Um, and so I've known maybe three, four, five of the Electa Quinney fellows that come to UW to share their to share their information, and that's been great. Uh, but in particular, one of them taught a course on uh, boarding school background. Wow. Uh, another one taught one on 
uh, understanding the whole sense of how how well the native um, sovereignty was done in the way they did their you know like like um, the just the diplomacy involved how they were diplomats so wow. I, I was just a pleasure to take the classes from those visiting professors that sounds so, that sounds wonderful so, thank you so her memory is still there <laughs> that's wonderful yeah uh, this artist honors Electa Quinney in our biography, and she also has a website, and if you just search her name, you can find it, and we'll include the link in our email for you, where you can find her artwork, beadwork, paintings, murals, and then beautiful coloring pages in so many different tribal languages as well to print for students. This depiction is actually of a carpet that she designed, a beautiful circle carpet, and I just love how it includes animal tracks in the different flowers surrounding the moon here. I think it's so beautiful. So just a gorgeous example of her work and um, illustration. And we get that countdown breakout room message that always like stresses me out. So it, it <laughs> it's a little confusing within PBS learning media to find other resources, but I just wanted to make sure you knew that in searching Molly of Denali, you will also come across a family and community learning guide. And that has other resources to do family engagement programs, but also very beautiful ideas with downloadable, printable, bilingual resources for you to use in your classroom as well. So within the Molly of Denali collection, it's a little bit of a separated family and community learning guide. And I think you will thoroughly enjoy exploring that as well. One of the activities is working on making um, exhibits for a kind of a museum that students want to set up that represents their family and their own culture. Great, that makes, uh, just making sure we're capturing this information. This will be on the YouTube channel later if you wanna go back. And again, just that reminder that we're gonna be sharing a lot of information here with you in the next 20-ish minutes, but don't feel stressed out. Don't feel like you got to jot everything down. Don't feel like you got to take 100 screenshots to, to capture it all. We will send you links, and this video will also be living in posterity on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to walk you through some of these excellent resources that we have been uh, alluding to for the last hour or so. Okay. So a lot of folks come to us and they say, well, where do I start, right? Like maybe you're not comfortable teaching this uh, culturally sensitive information because you don't have the background knowledge to do it. Um, as David said earlier, I'd say the first thing is kind of what you're already doing, right? You're already going through that personal process of unpacking, unlearning, relearning. So just by being here, you're already kind of started. So congratulations and thank you for doing that work. Um, but when you think about where do you start with the actual resources that you're going to use with students, going to the Wisconsin First Nations website is a fantastic place. Uh, this is what David talked about as well. Um, and I'm going to click on a link here so I can show you a little bit more about this website. Again, I'm going to do this quickly, but I do find this website is pretty intuitive, so you'll be able to navigate this and explore it for yourself when you have a little bit more time. As I said earlier, this is just going to be the quick tour. <clears throat> okay, so after I landed on the homepage, you saw that I clicked on the resources uh, button. It's also up here, so I can navigate at the top of my screen with all these different uh, options. I'm on the resources page right now, and uh, I really, again, I like how intuitive this is. I like how clearly this is laid out. We encourage educators to teach about the native nations that reside closest to your school. Why would that be? Well, if you're an educator, you probably understand the significance of proximity. You probably understand how engaging it can be for students to connect with something that they have a pre-existing knowledge of. There's already background knowledge baked in, so they feel more confident advancing the information, having a place that they start from. So think about uh, Native nations that are closest to your school 
And that's a good place to start with your students. Instead of talking about what the town or city or school district is called now, take them back in history and talk about the original indigenous names of that place, a good place to start. You'll also notice that uh, this is an opportunity to talk about geography and maps. The maps that we are going to send you via post mail are, are beautiful, they're illustrative, you're going to be able to put them up on your wall so they'll be big and bright, um, but you can also access them here uh, on the website if you want to put them up on a smart board or on a projector, you'll have that option too. You'll see these two links right here, we'll show you the maps that I am speaking about. And there's another one, Current Tribal Nations. You may recall early in the session today, Jamie actually put up a map that was similar to this, showing off the, the 12 tribal nations as they uh, are currently in existence in Wisconsin. And these are the different symbols that are associated with them. This map will be very similar to the one that Jamie shared in her introduction slide uh, with a little bit more information here. So you'll be, you'll be getting to get a closer look at that too. All right, second. Select the grade level and resource types. David mentioned before that you know sometimes we can do inadvertent harm or an inadvertent disservice if we're sharing the wrong types of resources. Sometimes that's just a matter of making sure that we're being uh, grade level appropriate with what we share with our students. Again, this is a big range that we're talking about, third through 12th grade. So I'm gonna leave that up to you as the professionals to figure out what the right re resources will look like and sound like for your particular grade level and your particular um, level of student as well, mentally, emotionally, socially, et cetera. Using place-based uh, education questions, this is sort of foundational to the Wisconsin First Nation way of educating. Click on the link, and now we have some really great big broad questions that we can develop uh, ideas around, we can develop goals around, we can develop missions for learning around. How long have humans lived here? On whose ancestral lands do you live? Who are your tribal neighbors today? This is also a map that we'll be sending to you. Uh, and what I really love about this one, and I know that David also loves, is that instead of just looking at the history and framing indigenous culture through that historical lens, this also makes sure that we catch up to the contemporary issues and contemporary indigenous cultures as well. You can see some of these really cool photographs uh, in this visual, and there's a lot of contemporary uh, photos. Many of them are screenshots from a uh, indigenous contemporary video series called The Ways. You can see it mentioned down here where my cursor is moving. We'll talk about The Ways shortly, but that's where a lot of these images come from is for that video series which might be another cool connection for you to make with your students. You'll have the poster with the still images. You'll be able to show the videos as well. And lastly, number four on this, where do I start page uh, on Wisconsin First Nations? You can reach out directly to the folks that run Wisconsin First Nations with any questions. There are also teacher exemplars. Every good teacher knows that we beg, borrow, and steal to get by. We share knowledge. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's also how we support our colleagues and support students that we're not teaching firsthand. So here are, oh, you'll recognize that guy. There's David O'Connor. But there's some other uh, educators here in the mix too. And when you click on them, uh, you'll get a short video where they're being interviewed about how they uh, integrate Indigenous cultures into their classrooms and into their curricula. Um, there's also some great uh, footage of these lesson plans and these unit plans unfolding in real time with students, but you'll also get some sit-down interviews with these different educators speaking directly to how they've made this work. Uh, something that um, I think is important to point out is that among these educators, um, there are several white folks, white educators here too. Oftentimes, one of the biggest questions that we get is from white educators who say, I don't feel comfortable doing this. Um, I don't know that it's appropriate for me to do this. And those questions and more are addressed in some of these teacher exemplar videos. So I highly recommend that you check them out, not only to get some great ideas, but perhaps also to help you feel a little bit more secure about taking on this work um, and doing it in a responsible way. Okay, back to the resources page. 
David talked about the huge gap in representations in children's literature. So if we're gonna talk about books and we're gonna talk about literature, this is a really important part of the Wisconsin First Nations website. Um, these are all grade banded books, book lists um, that go from K to two, all the way up from nine to 12. And then also for educators to build their own background knowledge as well. Um, really, really good uh, book lists here, but also there are some uh, plans based on your budget, based on your school's budget, uh, to, to figure out what exactly you can afford to bring into your classroom at any given time. Um, so uh, I, I really like these lists because they can give you ideas that you might be able to use now if you have the money, but they also guide you if your school doesn't have the means to buy everything right now about what you can use and then perhaps start thinking about what you what might be on your wish list for next school year when there's a little bit more room in the budget or for next semester when you can write a grant to, to get that money to buy those books. These book lists will uh, give you a sense of all of that, the content and the financial pieces involved as well. And then as I scroll down past these book lists, you'll notice that I'm gonna land on uh, a link right here mentioning Wade Fernandez. So I'm gonna click on this, and this is gonna take me to something called Resound Songs of Wisconsin. This is a PBS Wisconsin Education cultural music series uh, that features musicians um, that, are, that are playing and making music of different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. This is the indigenous feature on the site right now from Wade Fernandez. And when I go here to the actual website, it is chock full of great stuff. Obviously, this is a really great resource for music educators because Wade is a musician. You're gonna have a, um, an interview video here that talks about how uh, Wade's process works in writing music and creating music. Um, all of his music is done in his native language of Menominee. He talks about that. Uh, you're going to get a live video of him playing music in real time. Uh, this music, again, even though it's sung in Menominee, there are English subtitles as well. And then outside of the videos, there's also, oh, you can uh, just play the audio here if you want. There's also this educator engagement guide at the bottom. I'm not going to download it now, but suffice to say, there's some really great stuff here, including lesson plans, guiding questions. All of this is standards aligned as well. Even though this is maybe most um, practical for a music teacher to use, this is also excellent for a social studies or a history or an English language arts teacher to use as well. Certainly in the capacity of exploring um, culture and the uh, uh, exploration of language, uh, creating music, there's a lot of options and ways that you can use this resource. So I recommend you check it out and just sort of let your, your imagination wander. Think about how this might plug into your classroom, even if you are not a music education teacher. Okay, I'm gonna click off Wade and now I'm back to the Wisconsin First Nations page. I'm gonna go back to that resource list. And because we are running out of time very quickly, I'm just going to sort of scroll here to show you how many other resources there are available on the Wisconsin First Nations site. There's one, two, three more. There's five, six, seven more, eight, nine, ten more. Uh, and you can see here that I can keep clicking, right? There's even more pages after these. They just keep going and going. It is a treasure trove of of excellent resources. There is something for every content area. There is something for every grade level here. And although it is going to be a bit time intensive for you to explore, I promise you, speaking from personal experience, going through this collection, going through these resources for the sake of teaching to your students is also going to be great for the sake of your background knowledge and your comfort level teaching this as an educator. So I know your schedules are probably very, very tight as it is, but know that the time that you put into exploring all these resources has a double benefit for you, but also for your students as well. Um, and also, the, you know, like give yourself the time and the space. You don't have to do it all tonight. You don't have to do it all tomorrow. One of the goals around this webinar is to help you think about Indigenous Peoples Day 
as more like indigenous people's year-long integrated learning. So maybe you find a few resources that you could plug in for next week on Indigenous Peoples Day, but then you take a little time to just explore and you start thinking about how some of these resources might be really nicely integrated for some unit that you're planning to do in January of 2023. Or maybe you have a teacher that you know does a really cool unit uh, in the spring semester. So you tell them about this and now they can fold it in too. Remember, the goal is not to do everything all at once. The goal is to figure out how to do this intentionally throughout an academic year. And I got something in the chat here. I have a book that should be included in these lists called American Indians in Milwaukee by Antonio J. Doxator, Oneida Nation of Wisconsin by uh, Arcadia Publishing. Antonio, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, folks uh, who are here, that is something you might want to write down because that's obviously not here. Uh, Antonio says it should be. Antonio, I would recommend you reach out to the folks uh, running the Wisconsin First Nation site and let them know. That sounds like it would be a wonderful addition to their collection. Thank you for sharing that. All right. So we've done a pretty good uh, exploration of Wisconsin First Nations, but one other feature that I want to show you uh, is the really, really great search feature. So you can narrow down exactly what you're looking for on this site. Everything over here on the left-hand side of the website helps you really narrow the focus of what, you're wanna, what you wanna look for. As I showed you, there are pages and pages and pages of resources. If you're looking for something specific and it's time sensitive, you can't go through everything, this is a way to narrow your search field based on um, tribal lands, based on grade level, based on resource type. You click these down and suddenly this big field of resources gets very narrow and catered to exactly what you are looking for. Okay. Let me bring back my slides here. Oops. Sorry, that is not what I wanted to show you. That's what I wanted to show you. All right, we talked about the book list. We talked about the tiered purchasing plans. We talked about uh, the teacher exemplars, but two other features that I wanted to point your attention to, and these can be accessed through um, the Wisconsin First Nations site that we just explored, but I wanna just sort of give it a, a special feature now because I think these are uh, two of the best parts of the site. Uh, there is the Tribal Histories Collection. Uh, as the name indicates, these are uh, like 25 to 30 minute histories of all of the uh, tribal nations in Wisconsin. Uh, if I click on one, I get a little bit of background knowledge on the video, and then you can see I've got a 26 minute video on the tribal history of the Bad River Ojibwe. Um, we have those for all of the tribal nations. Again, it might feel a little time intensive. Don't feel like you need to watch them all right away. Maybe think about going back to that very first thing we saw on the Wisconsin First Nations website. Think about where you teach. Think about where your students live. Connect that place with the tribal land and show that video to start or watch that video yourself to start to build up your own background knowledge. Over time, you might get a chance to watch more and more of these and think about how different videos might come into play in your curriculum. Uh, so that's a really, really awesome resource. Another one that I wanted to highlight, I, I alluded to this earlier, is a video collection called The Ways. Um, the big emphasis on this collection is to show native culture in a contemporary light. The Google search that David did earlier is so indicative of this antiquated framework that we have, um, where mainstream America tends to have this, this very skewed view, view of uh, indigenous culture as a thing of the past. That is anything but true. Uh, and it is a disservice to not inform our students about how thriving um, uh, the, the contemporary culture is in addition to issues that the contemporary indigenous culture is facing. This collection called The Ways will give you stories of 
all of these different facets of contemporary indigenous life. Uh, these are a bit shorter than the tribal history videos that I just shared. These are like more like seven to 10 minutes each. Um, and you can see that the links here give you a bit of an idea about what each video is gonna focus on. But you'll also see if you go to the PBS Wisconsin website of these that you'll get a bit more uh, background knowledge. Or if you click on the link and scroll, you'll get that same background knowledge um, and some sort of overarching details before you click on the actual uh, video to watch. So this one is called The Ways Clan Mother Healing Community. Um, I've got a video transcript here too, so I can read the dialogue in addition to just watching it. Um, and we just got our notice. We only have one minute left. Folks, I'm so sorry. I, I get talking about this stuff and I get so excited. I lose track of time. So let me quickly show you uh, one last thing. Wisconsin Biographies. This is uh, a site through PBS Wisconsin Education. Um, it tells the story of some notable Wisconsinites. Oftentimes, these are folks that are not in the national history books. These are folks that uh, you might not have heard of, but they have made grand contributions, important contributions to the state of Wisconsin and the nation and the world. Among these biographies, there are several uh, indigenous figures. There are the biographies. Well, I didn't get through everything. I got cut off. Jamie, did you get through everything? It never fails. It never fails. But... Um, I think that's maybe a good problem in some ways, because uh, I know that at the very least, my group got to see the places they can go to find these resources and learn more about them. Yes, and ultimately, we know that's why you're here, and we hope that you thoroughly enjoy investigating those further. Absolutely. Um, Jen, are there any uh, questions from the Padlet that uh, might need to be shared with any of us, David, Jamie, or I? Nope, I don't see any on there right now, but that can be a space for discussion moving forward. Excellent. Great. Uh, David, do you have any final words before we wrap up today? Certainly. Uh, first and foremost, just want to say miigwech, which is Ojibwe thank for thank you to PBS Wisconsin Education for the opportunity to partner on this work. Uh, so both Jamie, Michael, as well as Jen, as well as may, many amazing other folks that are not here with us today. I also want to say thank you to each of you as well for the opportunity to be in this space. Um, look forward to future opportunities for future programming, other trainings or, or professional development opportunities as well. I strongly encourage you to check out both the Wisconsin First Nations uh, website as well as the DPI American Indian Studies Program website. We have a dual offer a lot of trainings that are across our state that you can access that are low cost or free as example as well. And so if this is your first time into coming to a space, uh, uh, seeing something discussed around indigenous education or studies, uh, great. And if it's your, if you're all one of those folks that have been doing these for a long time, love to see those spaces as well. And so with that being said, folks, I just want to say gigawama minwa, which literally translates to, into an Ojibwe to I'll see you again or I'll see you later. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much for being with us today, David. It is such a, a, a treat and a pleasure to learn from you. Um, we really appreciate your time. Uh, everyone else, we just have a few more things to talk about, and then we're going to let you take our little survey. It's very quick. It'll take you maybe two or three minutes. Then you can get your certificate of participation if you'd like. And remember, too, that we're going to follow up this webinar with an email that will have links to all the great resources that we talked about today. Um, let me share my screen one last time. Okay, um, if you liked what you saw today in terms of the PBS Wisconsin-based classroom media, we also recommend you check out PBS Learning Media, which is sort of the hub for PBS across the country. Uh, you'll find all of the Wisconsin media at PBS Learning Media, but you'll also find media from all the other PBS affiliates, all the other PBS uh, education productions teams. This is where you'll find all of it. It's a great resource. Beware, it is bottomless. It, there's so much here. 
but there are some great uh, search features that will help you narrow your focus and find what you're looking for a little faster than others. Uh, it's a great resource and we highly recommend you check it out um, for indigenous resources and, and anything else you might be looking for. And then lastly, we would love to stay in touch with you. Um, we're hoping to do some more webinars throughout the year about indigenous culture. We'd love to let you know about that in addition to other programming that we put on. So please feel free to follow us on social media. Please feel free to uh, follow us on email, be part of our listserv, so you can be the first to know about updates. Not only will, you, will we tell you about uh, some great events and webinars that we have coming up, but you'll also be the first to know when we are putting new media out into the world. In my group, the last thing that I talked about was the Wisconsin Biographies Collection. Um, we're gonna be having some new featured videos for Wisconsin Biographies coming out very soon. Uh, one of them happens to focus on an indigenous figure, a very important, very interesting indigenous figure. When that goes live, we would love to let you know about it. And this is how you can be one of the first to know is follow us uh, and join our email list. Uh, let me check the chat here, make sure I didn't miss anything. Thank you, yes, thank you all for being here. And uh, can we put the link for the survey in the chat? And with that being said, folks, this has been a pleasure. Thank you for coming today. Remember, tell your friends, they can watch the video later. Keep an eye on your email for links to the resources. Keep your eye on the snail mail for some free maps and some other free PBS swag. David, Jamie, Jen, did I forget anything? Very thorough. Thanks so much, everybody, for spending this beautiful afternoon with us online. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you can hit the link to uh, share your feedback with us and uh, be well. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.